Judy, lovely to see you. How are you? Brilliant. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you very much for doing this. I appreciate it. I'm delighted to be here. When I when I was asked, I was like, oh, this is something a bit different and exciting. So <laughs> no, thank you. And Alyssa, I'm really excited to talk to you about your career. I mean, you you um, started off and you did uh, a degree in business economics. I think your master's of business economics. And then you you've gone traveling. You've gone to like 100 million countries and you've worked in these places. Um, you've done broadcast journalism. Uh, you've done TV production and editing, and I want to talk about all those things uh, if we if we can can do that later on. But you're also the founder of the Vid Academy, so I thought we might start off with that, and maybe you could tell everyone a little bit about what you're doing today. Sure, I suppose our mission is to make video simple for everyone, and uh, it started about five years ago. Um, I actually got a normal job. I decided to leave the video world altogether. Uh, following kind of a burnout and uh, I was like right I'm going to I drove to Spain actually I got I had a van at the time for all my video gear and uh, I drove it to Spain had a little bed in the back and drove the entire Camino de Santiago to the end of it laughing at all the people walking and going I'm after <laughs> cheating the Camino uh, no I'd love to go back and do it again actually properly wow. but, uh, but it was great yeah, came back then and uh, I applied for a job in UCC and I started working there as a business administrator full time, five days a week, and then became a project manager in there. But I kind of started to miss video then again. I was like, oh. and then I was learning all this project management stuff. And I was like, how could I like apply project management to video production? Because video production is a creative thing and we often miss the process part of the planning and the filming and the editing. So I was trying to kind of at nights, evenings and weekends put together a course. And then I went and did a entrepreneur, um, a New Frontiers program. Um, it's kind of popular in Ireland for entrepreneurs. And <clears throat> at the end of it, I wanted to you know, teach people how to make videos. But at the end of it, they were saying, you know, it's not scalable, really, because it's just you and it's not exportable, really. And I was like, hold on. Second, if I make online courses, that's scalable and exportable, but they, it didn't fly. <laughs> so they were like, OK, I don't think you're ready for New Frontiers phase two, but how would you like to come on as a trainer for phase two? So that was like, you know, massive all nighters all week, getting everything just perfect. And that was my first group five years ago. And then ever since then, I've been teaching, I suppose, marketing professionals, academics, researchers. And since COVID, since last year, everyone has started to kind of jump on board the the importance of video as a tool for communication and how to get better at it, you know. So it's it's been yeah. it's been a trip. Yeah. So it's it's five years since you started the Vid Academy. Is, is that a, is that it? Setting up your own company and how has that how has that been? The whole experience of setting up a company of your own, having been through you know the the previous work experiences that you had. Like it's funny because I was I was pretty much always self employed. I was always like a contractor, or I had a business that was making corporate videos for businesses. And then I was on Irish TV. I had my own show, but we were contracted, so I'd have to deliver an episode every week, and then they'd pay you per episode delivered. So it was like it wasn't much different. But this this one started to kind of get traction. This one started to kind of pay off more you know and not just financially but like it was really enjoyable and I could you know I was adding to slides every night I was consuming content but then adding it to what I was doing so the other stuff for me felt it, it was just difficult it was like you know just pushing sand up a hill or whatever that saying is I'm so terrible at saying that I was making them up on my own but like this one Sounds was good. like yeah but this one was much more like going with the tide as opposed to pushing against it i think that's the right thing yeah yeah no that that that's brilliant i mean how did you i mean i'm going to take it right back and we'll we'll come back to the video vid academy again but you you did business economics like way way back when you were doing the ucc course so what was the driver of of doing that like why did why did judy decide to do business economics Back in the day. Judy never wanted to do business economics. <laughs> <laughs> Ju Ju Judy decided to do what would please everyone and just like, you know, get me to kind of the other side. I always knew I wanted to go traveling and I, I really loved business studies in school, but I really loved like when I was younger, I loved camera. My parents bought a camcorder when I was like 
four years old and I've got loads of footage and it's how I open up my workshops. I, you know, I always tell people that they need a hook at the start of their video to hook the viewer in. And my hook at the beginning of my workshops is my baby video where, you know, I'm there with a big Cork accent and I'm like, I'm Judy Breida Russell. And uh, it's, it's a nice... <laughs> I saw it today. <laughs> did you see it? Yeah, yeah. I did. It's excellent. Yeah. So so that was like what, what, what made me want to work in video and have kind of a a more, I guess, a different career path. But I I think like most of us, and I don't know if it's Ireland or international, but like you go to school and then you get so many knocks from school that you're like, okay, I'm going to fly under the radar instead and, you know, do something that I, I'm not going to get too noticed by and isn't going to make me stand out and stuff. So that's that's what led me to the economics. Well, I suppose I studied the arts degree as well. And it was my, my friend's mum who was like, don't pick something now. Because I was 16 when I did my leaving search and I was young. So oh, you're very like, young. Don't yeah. pick something. Yeah. 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 So she was like, don't don't pigeonhole yourself now. Do arts. Do like pick courses or pick um like modules that you're anyway interested in and then go from there. And economics was one of the modules. So then you know, I it was a 12 month then master's program. So it was like, great, OK, I'll do this and then I'll fly off around the world for as long as I can. Yeah, brilliant. And w- knowing what you do now and, and the job that you 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 do and the career you're pursuing, if you were to go back to college now, would you do something differently that would support you in what you've kind of gone down the route of doing? Or, or was the, the arts and the economics master's did it help you along the way? It, it definitely did. And, you know, like, I suppose what my business USP is, is that like I am biz, have the business acumen and that kind of, you know, that professional sense of understanding how businesses work and understand or learning the vocabulary during college and kind of not feeling like, an imposter, I guess, when you're like meeting with CEOs and, you know, training people who are really high up in companies, you know, I I don't really feel too, like sometimes I do, I still get nervous all the time when, you know, when I'm training people and stuff. But I think that gave me that, that part that I was able to bring in then to video, which was a little bit unique. So I make everything applicable to deliverables, milestones, you know, and then merge it with the creative stuff of the video production. So I think it was great. And I loved studying it. I loved like economics and the theory behind it and understanding how economies work. And but then I was also during arts, I was studying economics and sociology. And I found that those two subjects like completely contradicted each other. Like one was all about like advancing societies. And then the other one was all about like money, 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 you know, and (laughs) and it kind of left me at the end of it going, oh, my God, I don't know. I don't know what the world is about. So I thought then (laughs) traveling would help me figure it out. And I don't think after, I don't know, 25 years that I'm any wiser about (laughs) what our purpose is and what we're all doing here, unfortunately. But I think that's really cool, though, when you say that that two kind of maybe two opposites when you're looking at sort of the the art side versus the business side but that's that gives you great perspective of both things because they're both equally important so it probably is a good balancing act to start your career off on it gives you that kind of two two pronged approach to 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 a career i think that's really good um and then you you decided to go traveling so t- i know you did a lot of traveling and you got a lot of experiences as you went along so after you did your master's in business economics, then you decided to take some time. Was it the original idea just to take some time off or was it always I'm going to travel and work? I, I, I think I wasn't coming home when I left. Like, I think like I was like, I'm going to start a new life now out there and it's going to be so exciting and I don't know what's going to happen. And, and I suppose then you come to the reality of when you're away and, you know, I think some people are like, oh, you were away for five years and they get this like vision of me drinking margaritas on a beach every day and not realizing like that you have to support yourself. You have to find the job. You have to find the place to work. You have to save up to get to the next place. Like there was no money coming in from anywhere. Like it was like, okay, you're on your own. But there was never anything more exciting for me than arriving in a country with like a one-way ticket. I probably needed to get a ticket out for my visa purposes, but like feeling like I had a one-way ticket and going, I have no idea where I'm going to live or where I'm going to work. And and just like exploring the city and and just that that sense of like almost free falling and just 
having faith that somehow life will like put a net and catch you and it always did and the further I like I haven't done anything like that now in such a long time except for the Spain trip I guess but that was more controlled because I have my van with me so I could you know I had like, more <laughs> options um but like that feeling I, I miss a bit you know of just like not knowing what's going to come next but trusting that it's going to to work out somehow brilliant yeah and and you ended up in I think you, where did you go first was it US or New Zealand was it one of those? New Zealand first and, you know, worked in bars, managed a hostel, uh, managed a hostel for the majority of my time there. And uh, and then went to Australia for a year, loved, loved Australia, worked in a kiteboarding school, built stalls for exhibitions in the Melbourne Exhibition Centre at night. Um, wow. It was just like the most random jobs in the world. But I was constantly like the only thing that I could really do was bar work like that I'd experience in bar and waitressing. And the masters didn't mean anything when I was away. I remember applying to PwC in um, in in Melbourne, and like they were like, "No, who, who was your one?" Uh, so I was like, "I need a job. I need like I need I need a career. I need something that I can, you know, bite into." And even I remember in Melbourne at the time, we met a lady about getting a stall in their market, and we were like, "Okay, let's make soup," or you know, I was always trying to come up with ideas to just earn a living or make my own income somehow but that never transpired and then it was Costa Rica then when I kind of started on the the video route I guess. Yeah and how did you get down to Costa Rica how did that all happen why there? Okay so like this, this is this is a random one I at the time I had dreadlocks right and dreadlocks are fine in New Zealand and Australia like people work in banks with dreadlocks right you're, you're totally cool then as soon as you kind of cross over the other side of the world it's like okay the perception is completely different I've got to get rid of these um, but I traveled India I met my mother who invested in a cruise for me I got to go so after India I was all like I'm a person of the world now, you know, I just want to save the planet and save everyone. And she was like, do you want to come on a cruise? And I was like, oh, yeah, fine. I don't think I'm going to enjoy it, though. And like th- day three on the cruise, I was like, oh, my God, this is my best life. I love it so much here. But it, I've ended up meeting her and we she kind of dropped me off in San Diego. My friend was in L.A. at the time, so I stayed with her for a month and got to see her life. She was working as a producer in kind of a production company, making lots of behind the scenes things for Disney movies and stuff. And I was like, oh, my God, that's so cool. You know, I was like, and I think I I ended up purchasing this really terrible camera, this really terrible Kodak camera from Amazon. And it was like 260p or something like that. Like it barely had any quality and the sound was terrible. But I was like, I'm going to become a filmmaker of them some sorts. So I left her and wanted to work in Central America teaching English. And it was like getting down to 400 quid. I had no laptop or phone or anything. Like I had to go to internet cafes to search for jobs. And I was kind of thinking, I'm going to have to go home now. I'm, I've, I've run out of travel, like it's it's time. And then I was in an internet cafe and this job came up for a sports news presenter, or a news spokeswoman or something. And like this was Craigslist now. So I was like... I don't even know if this is a real company or if this is like weirdos luring me in. But it turned out to be a real company. And they were an American company who were kind of affiliate marketers for sports betting. So sports or betting is obviously illegal in the States. So they kind of I think they were on the periphery of this. And then they were like, okay, we'll just move everything to Costa Rica. So they moved to Costa Rica and had this huge like office with uh, like they ran a forum and did lots of other things. Um, and so there was just like loads of people working on computers, like this whole floor of staff. But downstairs, then they had this like news production room where they had like the green screen, the lights, the camera, this um, TriCaster, it was called, that allowed you to like broadcast multiple cameras and professional mics to YouTube like 10 years ago. And, you know, they, in, in my head, like completely naive, I was like, this must be in every company. Like every company has one of these secret rooms where they do their their video stuff. And it's only like since March last year that I'm starting to see companies like get in touch with me about different type of equipment they should buy to invest in this. And even what I have today, like it's it's all mimicking what we had in Costa Rica. And it was just the biggest learning curve. It was just brilliant. Like it was so exciting to 
and we, we'd free reign. It was like, make YouTube videos, make a live show, make, make whatever you want to do. Just just keep making content. Like, so she's making stuff up, like, but it was brilliant. Yeah. Really, really fun. Fantastic. And, and, and that was maybe the start of the seed to what you're doing today and, and all that kind of supported, supported that. And that was well, very that was, brave. Yeah. That's very yeah. brave. Like, it's such a brave thing to to do, to go down there and to tackle something I guess you hadn't really done before. Um, it was a really really good thing god yeah I remember how terrified I was like and I'm still I still get anxious presenting you know like I don't know if that will ever leave me and I almost hope that it doesn't you know like like I remember a surfer telling me before that like if, if you're not scared to get into the water don't get in that day and you know like I think there's a fine line between like crippling anxiety and feeling nerves that kind of yeah. make you more enthusiastic and engaging but it's it's always there so and I, I remember just feeling like completely out of my depth and I remember they they were positioning me as kind of like the, the dumb blonde kind of presenter style and um, the producer in there and I, I just went with it I was like grand you know there was, there was one video where like they did a split screen and I had a twin and one was the evil twin who was betting on the the cowboys and the other one then was the like nice twin who was betting on the other team and it was just bonkers and thank god the the manager the director of the company was like I don't see Judy like this I see Judy as professional kind of news presenting the odds of the evil and stuff like that so luckily we managed to delete a lot of that original but I don't, I don't have to look at it anymore and I kind of found my groove then yeah something you said there that, that kind of resonates with me a lot is when you say you still get nervous right because to listen to you now and I've watched some of your your videos that that you have on YouTube as well you come across absolutely professional and confident you know your stuff you'd never think that you're nervous you know behind the scenes or before um, and I think a lot of people have that. A lot of people worry about, you know, even, you know, in corporate world where you're going to committee meetings or you're in a meeting room with, you know, a, a large group of people and you have to present. You know, a lot of people get hung up on, you know, the nerves uh, before the event. And, and you touched on it there, you know, getting to that crippling anxiety element of it. How do you manage that nerves? Like, what, what do you do to settle those down before you start a video or you start presenting? Well, I suppose, you know, like there's, the, I suppose there's lots of things that I do and I recommend people to do. But like I, I see, I find presenting to people and presenting to camera are two completely separate skills. And I mm. learned this mm. during Irish TV because I used to interview a lot of people. Um, I had to make it was like nationwide basically for Cork so I had to make a half an hour show about Cork every week like sports business news and something else and so the amount of people that I'd interview every week was like frightening but I'd often turn up at an event and someone would be speaking from a podium to a huge audience of people and they would be so confident and like no stuttering all their words would come out perfectly and then they'd come off the stage and I'd stick a mic in front of their face and they would just completely crumble and the opposite then would happen where, you know, someone would be talking to camera to me and they'd be like, yes, we're having a great day here at the Mallow Races. We're just really enjoying ourselves. And then they'd get up to speak in front of people and that side of them would disappear too. And I was like, like, I've never found evidence to prove this. It's just from observation over the years. But even myself, I think I need to do different things when presenting to camera than I do to presenting to people. Like when I'm presenting to camera, like I find technical stuff is really important like making sure the audio is good the lighting is good the background yeah. is good I, I, making eye contact with the camera and something that I've been working on is not being too rehearsed because when I started off presenting I was reading like I, it was all teleprompter stuff so recently I made an online course and again I got a teleprompter and I set it up and I, my scripts are written and I started doing it and I was looking back and I was like I'm losing what I have in my live workshops like I have like you know the saying sentences all wrong and messing up like things and I, I'm I'm like I, I'm light-hearted and I think that that translates in my live workshops but in my kind of pre-recorded online course I was very wooden and not as I suppose enjoyable to watch I don't think so you know right. even though I've been presenting to camera for 10 years I I think knowing that it's it's a continuous improvement thing it's just every time trying to 
make it a little bit better and not being hard on yourself too like and not you know like sometimes my worst presentations are they're my worst videos that I thought are the ones that get the most views on YouTube and my worst presentations are the one that people come up afterwards and they're like really enjoyed that and you're like <laughs> okay I don't know what the secret yeah. sauce is <laughs> yeah yeah and and I guess like everything it's it's practice isn't it a, a lot of the time make, makes a big difference I mean I, I'd be similar well, I don't know if I'm similar to you, but certainly I, I would have when I was younger, I was very ner- would have been very nervous disposition as a as a kid, let's say, going into secondary school, that kind of age. Um, not confident at all in terms of speaking in public, always preferred the kind of one to one conversation, for example. And what I did uh, in secondary school was I, I joined the public speaking group just to see if that would help. And I'll never forget the first I, I had, I was entered into a competition. It was junior cert year and it was just me against one other person. So, <laughs> you know, it wasn't a big, uh, a big competition, but you know, a lot of parents showed up and all the teachers from the school. And I had practiced this thing for, you know, at least a month beforehand. It was the money is the root of all evil. I'll never forget the topic. And I stood up in the podium and I started and I froze after 10 seconds, completely froze and I remember the public teaching. He was also my geography teacher. He was kind of our mentor. He was just telling me, you know, calm down, start again. I started again, froze again. And th- three times I did it. So we're about a minute or two in now and I can't get out the first sentence. And uh, baptism of fire, really. But that experience, you know, kind of, I went straight into the worst case scenario day one. <laughs> so it was kind of the only way was up. But I stuck with that. And kept going with it, kept practicing every week. And then I joined when I was a bit older, went into the debating team in secondary school when I was like 17, 18. But the nerves never, ever left me. And even today, you know, I'm 40 years old, I still get a bit nervous depending on what the situation is. If I'm going into a big group, coming on here with you tonight at the beginning, I still get that kind of nerves. But I think that, you know, if you if you if you have that natural disposition, I think you, there's ways of maybe overcoming that you can get involved you know toastmasters and as you say practicing watching yourself back you know see where you might tweak it the next time do you watch yourself back judy at all is that how you would you do to to see unfortunately and i have to edit myself all the time so i'm constantly watching myself going and you know like you've you've mentioned now things that like i often go through in the workshops is like the psychology behind why presenting to camera is so uncomfortable for us and you know like the first thing that i talk about is like fear and you know our ancestors and you know they if they got kicked out of the tribe their chances of survival decreased so there was a an immediate threat to them by doing something stupid or communicating ineffectively like they could lose their life and you know I think that is embedded in our DNA when we're about to stand on a podium and speak to a large group of people or speak on camera but I'm always telling people like the difference when you're speaking on camera is that like you can delete it you're usually on your own now we're entering a very live kind of world but like most of the time you don't have to upload it so you know but it's also not to undermine the fear because it's there it's it's in us and I always just tell people to use it to become more excited and animated now if you're giving a speech on a topic that's you know not like you, that you're not trying to engage or animate people but in my case I need to be I it's my job to keep the people on the other side of the video engaged in what I'm saying so if I can kind of be a bit more energetic and give a bit more instead of you know so turning anxiousness into anxiety and then the other thing about video is well what I tell people what I suppose it's three things sorry but I I won't get into the third one but the second one is confirmation bias so we will find evidence to confirm our beliefs so if I think that I'm a really bad presenter when I'm watching myself back I will find evidence to confirm that I am a really bad presenter but you'll be watching me back and you won't have my confirmation bias so you won't see those same things so when I'm editing myself I try to pretend that I'm a third person I'm like that's presenter Judy and then all of a sudden I'm so much more kind to presenter Judy I'm like like her hands are flailing but look she's doing her best it's okay we'll forgive her (laughs) and move on so and I think that's much more effective than being like oh my god you're a disaster and just like giving out to yourself all the time yeah no I I fully agree and I don't know if you've uh, if you've heard or listened to a guy called Sam Harris he's uh uh, yeah I mean he's really good i mean he has a mindfulness podcast but he's lots of other things that he does as well but one thing he is said he that 10% was very happier is that the same guy 
ten percent happier. No, I don't it might know be a different that's guy. The one. It could be. It could be. Sorry. But but one of the things I heard him say, I think it was in a conversation with. Um, could have been Brian Green, the, the the physicist, in one of one of the episodes. But you touching it there, like the difference between anxiety and excitement, is practically zero. The feelings are the same. It's just the context you put around them, and knowing that as well, you know, if you, you know, my 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 daughter get, gets a little bit of anxiety sometimes, and I told her, you know, that feeling she had when she went on Thunder Mountain last year. She was thinking about it, and I said, "That's the same feeling in your belly you're getting, you know, when you're a little bit nervous." And uh, I, I only heard that for the first time last year, but it was kind of an eye opener for me. You know, if you think about it, you know, just you know, accept that feeling and go go ahead with it. I think it's it's uh, it was an interesting comment he made for sure. And yeah, and use it and like make make it your superpower if you can, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, Costa, what happened after Costa Rica? So wh- why did you leave and, and where did you go? I was thinking today, I was like, yeah, like for me, right, I, I'm, I'm very deep. Like I'm very, like I think about things an awful lot, you know, and it, like th- things kind of, what got to me about that position was that like the sports betting part of it, I was like, like it, even though it, it brought so much joy to so many people. I was like, I don't know if this is kind of, I'd, I'd rather do something. I'd rather be in an industry that's kind of just, I don't know. I don't know. So, but also not only that it was that I was, I was burning out. I was like, I, I was obsessed with my job. I had no friends in Costa Rica. Like I was, all I did was work like, and like, I was just learning and learning. I, I knew everything about like NHL, NFL, like I knew so much. And like now you you could ask me anything about any of these people who I could now have a conversation with the best of them about. And like whatever happened, I got on that flight and just emptied my brain of all of that stuff. So I don't know anything anymore. But I was also yeah. presenting and scripting. So I was doing a lot of writing and a lot of presenting. And the boys, I worked with five guys and they were all brilliant. And I tried to keep up with them still today. But they were all doing the camera and the lighting and the sound. And like also I, I was also always very competitive against boys I was like who do they think they are now I'm gonna learn how to do that so I came home and I was like I'd love to well I also saw the need for businesses to start creating videos but I was a little bit too far ahead people weren't seeing that need yet you know Mm. and um so I came back and I was like, right, will I go straight into trying to set up a business or will I go and actually trying to learn more about this? So I enrolled in this course in or I, I went for an interview for this course in Kerry. It was called TV and Video Production and it's in Mona Valley, Trilly, and it is the best course in like the whole wide world. Like, you know, when I was in UCC, like I'd turn up to my lectures and I'd I'd, I'd, I'd do the assignments that needed to be. But with this, like I was like top of the class, like asking questions. And, and how would you do this now in this situation and stuff? I'd say I drove the lectures insane, but it was <laughs> so cool. Do you know what you're just like? And all the people in the course as well, we were all around the same age. Everyone had some experience in TV and video. So straight away we were given projects to complete, like for the local school, go and film their play. And so while you weren't getting paid for it or they weren't paying, so there wasn't a huge risk, you still were expected to deliver to deliver something to them. So it was just this this 12 months of like rapid learning with a really great group of people, really great lecturers. And I think if I didn't do that, I'm so happy I did it because I was so on the fence about maybe I don't need to. But like I so needed to. I really needed that year. It was, it was brilliant. And what was the name, Judy, of that course again? Just for the TV and video production. I think it was a FETAC level six or a FETAC level five. And it was it was FOSS at the time. Yeah. Um, but now yeah. it's the Kerry ETB, I think. And mm-hmm. since well, like when the year I left, they were after like the, we were in kind of a warehouse space and there was a studio in there. But they moved into like a super double the size kind of amazing space after it. But it's, I, 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 I'm not I'm not odd. I'm not odd. I'm the best year of my life. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's great. And it's interesting, isn't it? When you when you do something that you love, the, the switch flicks, as you said, you know, not that you didn't enjoy your your you know, courses and degrees in UCC, but you were at that point in your life where you had a passion for something and there was a course that aligned directly to that passion and you did it. Yeah. And what happened and next? What happened next? 
Oh, sorry, go and ahead. After that, oh, sorry, then, no, not at all. I, I was living in Kerry as well. I was like, I love this place. And my mum, I remember when I was going down there, she was like, You're, will you get an apartment in Tralee? And I was like, no, I'm, I'm going to get a mobile home. And she was like, what? You can't live in a mobile home for a year. And I was like, of course I can. Where are you going to find one? I was like, I'll find one. Went on done deal. I was like, mobile home Kerry. The first one that came up went down a week later. Had this two bed mobile home with Sky TV, which I don't even have today. Like I was I was living in luxury. Nobody there all winter. The beach to myself. Like, ah, oh, it was just, wow. uh, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's, that's I, I'll have to go back there and do another course, I'd say. Yeah, was that close to Banner Beach? Which beach were you close to then? Camp, other side. Oh, other side, yeah. Amazing, amazing. And you, what happened after Kerry? Did you did you stay down there for a while or was it back back to Cork after that? It was back to Cork and then I got the... the so my friend who was producing those amazing things in Los Angeles, she was after returning home as well and working on great shows. So there was an editing position for The Fear, which was a hidden camera show on RTE. And she kind of just pulled me into that as the editor. Um, well, I wasn't editing season, so season three and season four. Season three, there was an ed- a senior editor above me. And then season four, I got to edit myself. So it was like, it was so cool getting like a television editing experience. But it also kind of thought me that I don't want to be an editor. And that was the funny thing about the TV and video production course is that they were always trying to make us niche. <clears throat> and that was something that I always fought against. They were like, you know, there's so much to learn in video and, and stuff. Like you can be a person who holds a boom pole for your entire life. And that is a very specialized skill. You can be someone who operates a teleprompter and that is your job. And that's your only job. Mm. And like, you know, sound is so vast. Cameras are so vast. Like there's there's so many jobs. And the advice back then was always choose one, become the best at it and go from there. But I was like, but I like lighting. I like presenting. I like editing. I I like all of the parts. And they were like, you know, you're going to find it difficult to find work if you don't kind of just call out where you are. And I think the same as today when people are like niche, double niche, niche down, niche on everything, you know, and that that just didn't suit me. So I just kind of didn't. But when I was editing, then I was like, it would have been very easy for me to get well paid. I probably would have had to move to Dublin. But I probably could have got well paid and worked on really interesting shows. But then I was like, now I'm going to blow it all up and just go back to square one again and see, <laughs> see what else comes up. And what, what is a day in the life of an editor? Can, can you describe maybe a, a typical day? And what was it about it that made you think, you know, I don't want to do this every day, all day? Yeah. It's it's the it's the it's the dark room on your own all day long, and it's the repetitiveness of like so you you get the footage and the footage comes in we like they were recording most of the show in Dublin, so it would be sent to us through like proper mail and you know in a box and then we take it out, we would back up all of the footage, try to organize it as much as possible, and then drag it onto the timeline. So that's when you know you've got camera A, then you're bringing on camera B, and there was like. I think there was five cameras. So you've got five cameras, you're synchronizing the sound and the video, and then you're cutting, you're kind of watching because it was sketches. So it was like going to people on the street and pranking them. And then sometimes there was no reaction. So you'd be watching this one, you'd be like, oh, it's going to get really good. And then something would happen where they'd see a camera and you'd be like, oh, no. Or, you know, or else like a lot of my time was spent doing administration because of like, you know, you have to get release forms signed by people after they are pranked. And if they don't sign the release, then you can't air their prank. So a lot of mine was matching up release forms with people. And then you pick out the best camera that has the best shot. And you can kind of like editing is amazing because you can, you know, change a sentence from the end to the start to make a joke work, you know, or even an expression. So, you know, the prankster might say to them, ah, where are you going today? And you're one, like the, the lady might answer and say, oh, I'm just going to the match. But instead you take a kind of her shot from later on. So it's like, where are you going today? And she's like, so it's 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 yeah. very cool what you can do to kind of make something more exciting to watch but then you have to watch that same sketch about 150 times before you go into picture lock and send it to the person who color grades it before it goes then to another sound person who does the sound pass before it then goes to RTE and they actually put it out to air so it was like And do you know what it was actually as well? My mum watched the first episode and I remember afterwards she was like, is that it? 
as if like is that what you spend the last six months doing it just seems like it all comes to, what have you been doing like it's just it's so easy you know and I was like oh my god <laughs> and you also worked um on the RTE production The Young Offenders didn't you was that in an editing capacity as well or was that something different that was so, so funny. My boss of The Fear, so he was the writer, or not the writer, but the producer and director with another guy, Derek. Um, so Peter was the kind of boss that I was in, that was in Cork, basically. So he left um, at the kind of around the end of season four to go to Lanzarote. And uh, and I was like, oh, isn't that lovely? Now Peter's off to Lanzarote for a holiday. But he wasn't going on holiday at all. He was writing the script for The Young Offenders. So he just locked himself in and just like wrote and came back with this amazing script. So at that time, it wasn't an RT production at all. It was like Peter's self-financed with a few other people's production. And, <clears throat> you know, I don't think any of us, may, maybe Peter did, but I don't think anyone on the cast or crew thought that that film was going to be as, you know, widespread and popular as it became so like we were kind of just working on this project where we drove around vans for the summer but I couldn't commit to it full time I had to you know <clears throat> earn a living making corporate videos for businesses so he was he, they were they were always so good to me and you know him and Julie were like because Julie is the girl from LA and she was the she, my best friend since I was 11 and she was the producer so they were like why don't you come on as the behind the scenes producer and so you can come whenever you like and just film the behind the scenes get some interviews with the lads and then we can put it on the DVD so that was such an eye opener for me then because I got to see inside film and you know and like sometimes like I, I still had the van so I was van driver some days I'd be caterer some days I'd uh, do camera B I was lying on the floor of the English market with a GoPro trying to get the bike going over the, the thing like some, like every day was brilliant. different because there were so many jobs to do and so little people so it was brilliant to do that and I just I can't believe what a success it turned out I'm so happy for everyone who was involved in it what an amazing experience yeah and is, is it something Judy you'd like to go back to in the future I mean as we said you're now you know running at the Vid Academy you, you clearly enjoy that very hard work building up your your brand and the business but all the other experiences you've had in in TV is it something you want to get back to or you've enjoyed the experiences but now you know it's it's the past it's it yeah it's 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 not at all and I, I I don't know what I want to do next but I suppose I have solace in the fact that I never knew what I wanted to do next and <laughs> even when you know I wanted to make videos for businesses that wasn't a job and video training wasn't a job and none of these things were jobs so like right now well I'm I'm a little bit like at this like I don't really know what to do next and mm. you know like as I was saying to you before we started talking, I kind of am a person who goes through a cyclical burnout every now and then. And it's usually every few years. And I'm just after kind of, you know, and like burnout, it's not a particular moment. It's just where for for me anyway, for like a period of a month or two, I'm just feeling really tired and not having that like March last year, I was like, okay, video. Okay, oh my God, I know what else we can do. We can do Zoom training. We can do this. I was creating courses. I was making videos. I was still working in UCC, organizing, you know, an awareness campaign for a massive event there. And it was just like, and then it was like, oh, the vaccine came out. Everyone started kind of opening up and going back to normal. And when all that happened, then I was like, oh my God, I'm really, really wrecked. <laughs> so I'm I'm there now. And I find it hard to kind of see I'm 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 finding it hard to come up with ideas. I'm I'm yeah. a little bit stuck and stagnant, but then I have to have that attitude that I had when I arrived in those countries and knew that I things would just work out if I just was myself and tried yeah. my best yeah. after the sleep. Um I yeah. and I hope so. You might meet me in a year now and I'll be like, no, it didn't work out at all, it was awful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I mean you clearly have that entrepreneurial spirit for things just talking to you for the last you know 40 minutes or so and I mean you mentioned you touched on on the burnout side but I guess that's because you you and you mentioned it earlier you you throw yourself like a thousand percent into the things you do you work all kinds of hours and it becomes everything for you doesn't it um, and is that the reason then you know you just you get to a point where it's just like you hit the wall a little bit you need to you need to take stock relax and then go again 
That's it. And that was, I suppose, the the problem with working with, you know, like working in a job as a project manager. There were, there were two kind of issues with it. The first thing was that, you know, I love the project management stuff, love, love learning about it. But when it came to, you know, these are the deliverables, all you need to do is achieve the deliverables. I couldn't stay within the lines, you know, if I... It's like if we had to get a radio campaign launched for an event or something, I'd be like, why stop at radio? We can go to TV. And then they'd be like, but we have it. That, that wasn't in the deliverable. And I'm like, who cares that it wasn't in the deliverable? It's just something better, you know? And and then, you know, so no, it's never anybody's fault for my burnout. Like nobody's ever asked me to burn out. It's always me doing it to yeah. myself. And then the other part, problem with me with jobs is that you finish one project and then the following day you start on another project and I find I need I my system is like all all go like all hours of the day like completely in the focus tunnel and it's probably not good for me in the long term but then I need the break then I need the the month to yeah. go to a new country or to drive somewhere random and just to bring get myself back again and that's always been the way and I, I kind of I give out to myself about that like I'm like why can't I just be a normal person um, but then <laughs> you know like I suppose it just you are who you are you just have to try and build your life around that as best you can absolutely absolutely and with the vid academy and what you're doing at the moment and, and that business what is it and, and th- because a lot of people um, that I've spoken to um, recently talk about, you know, their own business or starting their own business and they wouldn't have experience necessarily. And I mean, I had Ronan Noonan on, on the first podcast. He talked a little bit about his experience of starting, starting a business. But what, what for you, what do you love about that? And maybe what is the biggest challenge? And maybe you're going to say you touch on what you said already, but if we could just maybe address that a little bit. And, you know, the video training stuff, like it's, 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 that's the easiest part because, you know, I'm, I'm teaching people who are already, they're already so passionate about their ideas and their projects. Right. And what I do is I kind of break down the planning process of planning a video into eight steps. And it's like a workbook that they can fill out in their own time. And then I show them the possibilities of how they can film stuff with their phone. They don't need a professional camera. And then I introduced them to the Adobe Rush app that I was telling you about earlier. Yeah. And like I, I record myself during the workshop and I go and get stock footage and I bring the music and then I bring it all together live for them. So so then they're just like, oh, my God, it's just all come together. And, you know, it's like for me, I think that people don't realize how achievable it is and how you know it obviously takes a lot of time and a bit of like putting like this what you've seen into actual practice so you have to kind of you have to want to do it I suppose but but then when I'm seeing people sharing their videos on LinkedIn that they've created themselves and stuff like that I'm like yeah boom and you know a a lot of the time like people are making videos that I'm like I have to message them and go how did you do that there now that's so cool like they'll they'll find an app that does some kind of animation thing that I've never seen before and I'm like mind blown and and then I just rob that and bring it into the workshops then in future and I'm like yeah very good and I mean you're you're such a, a hive of in, information I mean even when we were talking before going live you mentioned Adobe Rush so just for the listeners when you mentioned that I mean I use uh, iMovies to, to put my recording and, and do a little bit of editing I do very little editing but just to, to put it together and uh, I was telling you my difficulties with with using that and get, getting my head around it. And you were telling me that Adobe Rush is a, a much more intuitive and simple, simple one. So thank you for that. But uh, you gave me loads of knowledge in the short chat we had before. So thank you. Thank you. And last question, uh, Judy, which I've asked everybody um, on the podcast so far. But if you could go back to, let's say, you know, Judy starting her arts degree in UCC and have a cup of coffee with her tomorrow what advice would you would you give her oh god that's a really um tough one but I yeah I suppose like I think I probably don't overthink everything and don't don't take everything so seriously as well like you know I was always like If I didn't pass an exam, it was the end of the world. If I didn't, you know, like, I just, I think I made the whole thing so difficult at times that if, like, I I wish everyone could see a picture of themselves 
at 60 or 70 or 80 and, and, and just see themselves, you know, smiling in a chair. And you're like, okay, at least I know I, I've, I can make it to the chair, you know, and like, and everything else outside of that is just whatever. But yeah, I just, I think, and I, but you know what, I give the same advice to myself today because I seem to get about 10% better every year, 5% better every year at that stuff. But like, it's, there's no book you can read or podcast that you can listen to that will like change your brain enough to, Yeah. Just go, yeah, now now I can see clearly and it's all figured out. It's just, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit tough. Like, li- yeah. Life is tough. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, listen, it's been a, a pleasure talking to you, Judy. I really appreciate you taking the time and I can't wait to see what you get up to next. You've had such a, an interesting career so far and uh, I'm sure it'll continue in the upward trajectory. So re-energize and, and let's see what happens. <laughs> But thank Thanks you. Thanks a million. I thank can't you. wait to hear the rest of your series. I listened to the first two the, uh, the other day and they're really, really good. So well done. Thanks a million, Judy. Thanks very much. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye.